All right, in a recent report, The Road to Wealth, how the racial wealth divide is hollowing out America's middle class. Hey, guys, um, I've gotten this report, shocking report, some key findings. I was tripped up on this because I watched this movie um, by Robert Reich, who is the uh, former uh, Clinton cabinet member, uh, advisor to President Clinton called Inequality for All. And this report even dives even deeper into the issue, which is racial inequality. This sort of affects Black America, Latino America, even Asian America, like myself, who's Filipino. Um, and some key findings here, it says, if current trends continue, uh, it's going to take 228 years for the average Black family to reach the level of wealth of white families that own today, of white of wealth white families own today. For the average Latino family, matching the wealth of white families would take 84 years. So, hey, guys, listen, uh, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Matt Cipolla, commonly known as Money Smart Guy. I run a financial firm called PHP Agency. Uh, and my role in, uh, in, in, in the company is not only as a co-owner, but to expand and grow agencies and to help people start their business in the insurance industry. And when I see this problem literally every day, every day, about people slipping down the wealth ladder, I've got to do this live stream and talk about this, backed up with some data. It's just not something that we see you know, commonly in our families, but this is actual reports and findings done by the, the Institute for Policy Studies and the uh, Prosperity Now uh, um, organization. And the authors, all right, here are the authors of this report uh, talking about uh, this issue, uh, De uh, Dedrick Asante Mohammed, Chuck Collins, Josh Hoxie, and Emmanuel Nieves, and um, and they're, they're working to inform and mobilize advocates across the country to push for policy change at the federal level that expands economic opportunity. So if you're watching this live stream right now, it's because you're pissed off about, pissed off about your financial situation, you're ticked off about living paycheck to paycheck, you're, you're seeing this, these issues happening all around you, and uh, I, I want you guys—I want you guys to know. Um, let's let's check out this uh, this this uh, this uh, uh, screenshot here. So, if the racial wealth divide is left unaddressed, median black income is going to go with zero by 2053. Okay. Um, here's another thing too, as well. Uh, uh, um, Black and Latino households need an advanced degree to obtain middle class wealth or higher, while white households, on average, only need a high school diploma to attain that same level of wealth. Well, there are a couple of things I agree with, and there are a couple of things I disagree with. So let's let's open up the dialogue, let's open up the conversation. I want to I'm going to welcome my friend uh, Curtis Eatman to this conversation. He runs an office out of Rancho Cucamonga um, in California. Uh, he's going to be coming to the show along with his wife, Spring, and uh, he's also a fellow co-owner of PHP Agency. We're going to talk about this issue. We're going to talk about this issue. We're going to ex expand this dialogue in this conversation. And guys, I want you guys to know I'm a voracious these days. I'm a voracious reader of books because if you want to solve the problem, you got to read books. Okay. And if you share this video, one of the books I'm going to be giving you out for the person that shares this video the most is a, is a book here by Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater, came from a middle-class neighborhood in Lake, uh, Long Island, runs Bridgewater. He's kind of like the Steve Jobs of the financial uh, investment world, but he wrote a book here called Principles, about he, how he established his personal life, where he came from, about, um, about uh, uh, how, he, how he views work and life based on principles. So uh, I think Curtis is going to be jumping on here in a minute. But, uh, hey, guys, I want to say what's up to you guys, for those of you joining this live stream. Uh, Doc, Derek Malulis, what's going on, Doc? Here, Rancho Office, going on, brother? I'm going to have Curtis on here in a second, as well as Spring. Uh, John Lance, what's going on, Devil Dog? Uh, military, by the way, this applies to a lot of military, household, military veterans and their households, too, as well. Uh, and here's the thing. Even though they might be comparing... Uh, the, this report says the road to wealth compares a racial wealth divide. It's not like white households are any that much different anyway. They're, yeah, they may be making a little bit more money, but it's not like they're vastly rich, right? So I, I don't want you guys to misconstrue all you know, white families and white households are getting much wealthier than black and Latino and Asian households. They're not getting any further 
as well. There's a gap. Sure, there's a gap, but it's not like they're making any more money. I I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, if the middle class were to be defined by wealth rather than income, uh, black and Latino families would need to earn two to three times as much as white families. So uh, uh, middle class is defined as households uh, 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 would need to own between 68000 and $204,000 in wealth to qualify for the middle class, okay? Um, and, 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 and those in the black and Latino households need to earn in the middle class uh, to earn, to get ahead financially, they need to earn more than $104,000 a year. So therefore they would qualify for middle class status or higher. Is that it? Sure, why don't you come on in? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, speaking of a uh, uh, Latino, and uh, a black family house. Uh, I want to introduce to you guys my wife. Um, this is my wife. She, she says, hi, baby. Hello. This is this is uh, this is Sheena Sapala. And uh, I want you guys to know that uh, she. Uh, what, what? Spring? Oh, hi what? There. Yeah, she, she's gonna be, she's gonna be joining here in a second. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be bringing out. I just want you to say I want you to say hello, babe. Hello. So, so sweetheart, uh, before we bring on, matter of fact, let's bring them on. Let's bring them on right now. All right, let's bring them on right now. Boom, there they be. Boom, beautiful oh, couples, hello. beautiful wives. Yeah, Goodness. there they are. How are you? <laughs> right? Spring Eatman in the house. Make sure. So excited to be here. Curtis, Curtis is right here. here. Yeah. Hi, Curtis. Cool. <laughs> hey, guys, how you doing? How you doing? All right, hello. very good. So so let, let's talk about this real quick, man. Uh, this report says there's a racial wealth divide. Uh, you guys, my wife deals with clients every day. Uh, I recruit every day. She sees clients. Curtis and Spring, they do the same thing out in Rancho Cucamonga. And, and just so you guys know, they are six-figure income earners, co-owner of PHP Agency, and they're part of the solution and not part of the problem. So let's talk about this real quick. Babe, um, you're half white. You're half white. You're Cuban and American Indian. Mm -hmm. Do you see the racial wealth divide between the families you see kitchen table to kitchen table on a daily basis in terms of having tightness with building wealth. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's scary because it's like they're trying to build wealth in the most uneconomical way. Uh, and you see a lot of it with in the minority population. It's just this gap going uh, bigger and bigger and bigger between those that are succeeding in this thing called money and those that aren't. And it's getting it's getting pretty scary. I would say that. Awesome. What about you guys? You guys deal with clients on an everyday basis. Um, you, you deal with people on, uh, on a kitchen table, uh, black families, Latino families. Um, you know, by the way, if you're interested in, in one color, that's the color of green. You've joined the right, you've joined the right uh, live stream video. Uh, what, what are you guys seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Is, is there any truth to this report that there's a gap between Latinos, African American, Black, Asian, and and her, and her white counterparts? I, I would say absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really, really sad because, um, you know, to Sheena's point, a lot of times people, um, you know, they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to, um, you know, put themselves in a better position. And so then you start seeing people going back to school, things like that. And unfortunately, they're just putting themselves in more and more and more debt um, because there aren't a lot of uh, opportunities out there, a lot of jobs, different things like that. But, um, you know, that's really kind of astonishing when you're saying it, you have to be making a hundred and four thousand dollars a year just to be in the middle class for let the latino and black community yeah. um and you know all this uh, you know a lot of times we're sitting with a lot of you know what we consider middle middle and lower class families and you know that that's not the reality <laughs> you know <laughs> most people are not making 104,000 most people are making between 30 and 50,000 and really trying to just scratch the surface of of keeping their their family afloat so yep. um you know, it's it's really unfortunate that that, you know, there's not as much opportunity, but you do see a lot more, um, you know, other races that are, you know, that are making this type of money. And so I think it's really interesting that uh, the Latino community, the black community, that they're kind of starting to be the majority, but then the yep. majority left behind as well. Yeah, to, to piggyback on that, um, and I, it will go into skills versus education to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I come from basketball background and, you know, um, and when we used to see people on the court uh, or, you know, if you want to use a baseball terminology on the field or whatever you want to use it, the, the best person on the court or the field 
has the most skills usually makes the most money. Right. And so and I think that's the same way in our economy as well. Whoever has the most skills usually has the most money. And what we have as a society, we've all been taught to, you know, go to school and things like that. But today is only bringing debt. And I'm pretty sure you're bringing those stats up as we speak. Um, and it's not really helping those local high schools today and the local colleges or curriculums are not really teaching us the principles of how to be really free. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a step behind because we're trying to follow a, a, a strategic way that's not really working anymore. And we're not adapting. And so for us, if we don't start learning you know, different skills for our different cultures and aspects of today's economy of the entrepreneurship way, then unfortunately we will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest phases right now. So according to this report, the racial wealth divide at the meeting over the next 48 years, as well as to 2045, which is just 26 years from now, uh, where the America is projected to be a majority non-white. So over the next 26 years, so, so you, you, how many, uh, how many guys, how many kids you guys got? 16? <laughs> Don't give me more. We've got <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're holding, okay? We're holding <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, think about your kids you know, over the next 26 years. How old will your kids be? They're, they're going to be your age. That's crazy. <laughs> and, and, and a majority of America will be non-white. Mm -hmm. And yet, according to this report, they will be broke. I, I think it's what uh, Curtis mentioned. I just started to pay attention. Like when you get into the world of, of doing things differently than what you've been taught, your principles do start to change. And what I've noticed, too, with uh, access to information for those that have figured out this thing called money, their principles and their values and the way they think and process different um, things in life are completely different than those that have never figured out this whole thing called uh, getting ahead of money or mastering money. And I remember sitting down with this individual and I said, the problem that I, I notice a lot is that even at the kitchen table growing up, now I come from, you know, multicultural background, the discussion of money was just so taboo. And it really bothers me thinking about it today because I feel like, why don't we talk about money? Why don't we talk about things that are good, things that aren't, things that are working, things that aren't? But it's like this thing you don't want to talk about, this whole pride and ego that's attached to being um, very transparent to, to the mistakes that are being made. And I go back and I say, you're absolutely right because I'm just growing up and, and, and reflecting on my youth and saying, I'm never taught to talk about money. I'm never taught to um, sit in a group dynamic and process issues. I'm taught to deal with my issues by myself. I'm taught to be afraid to ask for help or being afraid that I, that I made a mistake. And, and if you could just teach me how to do it differently, like even, even in high school, you sit there saying, okay, I have to take this really big, important test. And you get so stressed out about it because you're not supposed to make mistakes on tests, you know, and you sit in this room and your, your armpits are sweating. Like, how am I going to pass this test? I stayed up, you know, last night studying for everything just to be perfect when you're not supposed to be perfect. And you go in that room and I'm sitting to myself. It'd be great if I can nudge the person to the left of me, nudge the person to the right of me and say, hey, by the way, how would you answer this question? Yes. But in our in our traditional society, we're taught to not do that because that's cheating. But in the world of figuring out these problems about money, we need to start asking people around us. And I think that's where it starts. It starts when you're growing up being taught not to ask for help because you can't, it's considered cheating. And right. those dynamics, I think, are a big part of what, what Kurt just mentioned is the principles that were taught have kept us away from understanding, understanding or even mastering this thing called money. So let's talk about that, Curtis and Spring. What you guys are dealing with clients on a day to day basis. I mean, uh, I think you're leading the company right now. In terms of most clients helped, I think Curtis under your pen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're, how many how many applications, how many families have you helped so far in the first what fourteen days of the month, like like one a day, right? Yeah, fourteen. I think right now. Yeah, four, yeah. So you're, you're right now. Uh, Curtis is leading the company in personal clients helped this month so far with fourteen clients. So which by the way, which spanks the average production of the typical insurance producer out there, uh, purely because we have a system, we have a culture, and we got studs like. <laughs> Curtis writing business and you're attracting business. So you're dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. You introduce to them what my wife just said. You're introducing to them financial education. You're introducing to them opportunity. What's the, some of the pushback that you get from some of the clients that don't say yes to you? Yeah, that's such a great question that you're asking because yeah, not everyone's going to, you know, say, oh wow, this is it. this is the greatest thing on earth, right? And uh and it's pretty interesting though, because most of the time, 
I don't get that much pushback anymore. And I used to. And, and the reason why I used to is because my conviction, not really understanding like what I was really doing, I guess I would say, and not really understanding the crusade of like, well, there is really a separation happening right now with these financial costs and strategies that are not taught at our local high schools or colleges. And that what I'm doing right now at this current moment is I'm sitting in front of a family, I'm actually bringing a lot of value to them. Something, again, they're not probably going to be taught. It's pretty interesting you bring that up because I have people in my office that are from Princeton, go to the best private schools here in Brentwood and California, things like that. And they sit down with us and we talk about these financial costs and strategies. And they're like, wow, like they don't teach us any of this. Mm-hmm. Like my dad went to USC as an NBA at USC. And he's like, wow, like this is like they don't teach this stuff at all. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty crazy. So when I sit down with families today, the conviction is so high that now they're like, wow, like, you're right. We don't know what we're talking about. I'm open to now listening. Because I am probably doing the wrong thing right now and, and thinking it's the right thing. Mm-hmm. And that's the big problem right there. So the most pushback that I ever get now today is, well, okay, well, let me go and check this out. And I got them and say, okay, where are you going to go check it out at? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I mean, there's, 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 by the way, this is another uh, couple of reports. This is the Wall Street Journal. Are, are you underpaid? <laughs> are you underpaid? Because they're making comparisons between CEOs and middle class workers. Um, the U.S. states. This is a uh, uh, C uh, uh, MSN money. All right, uh, states with the highest levels of income inequality. I, I'm just kidding. You guys are in uh, California. Where do you think the California rates between income inequality? People between rich and those between uh, 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 middle class uh, and poor. Where, where do you think California ranks? <laughs> I, 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 it's, a, it's a tax just to breathe here, man. Thirty <laughs> percent. I, I don't think we're doing too well. <laughs> yeah. So California is number four. Oh, that's you, you, better you, than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> the the, the fourth to win here, I guess. So. Yes, true. N- number number one is New York. Mm, okay. Makes sense. That makes sense. Number two is Connecticut. Is it the way you say it? <laughs> Connecticut. Connect to kit things like the seventh time I've ever said that. Uh, number three is Louisiana. <laughs> really? Really? That's yeah. interesting. Huh. Yeah. Right. And number four is California. All right. Let's talk black women. Yes. And money. Ladies. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about it. We'll kind of forever. No. <laughs> <All right. laughs> what, what, what are some of the issues or? Uh, conversations let's let, let's be a curtis let's be a fly on the wall i know how black women talk about money and how to get ahead financially what what's going on you talk know, for us what's going the on conversation starts girl no <laughs> <laughs> so when it starts that way you know that that, that, that it's not too pretty coming after that the conversation right. um yeah. You know, honestly, I feel like um, there needs to be a lot more conversation about finances um, in the the Black female community. Um, I think that we've kind of come from a place where um, I think right now is a time that Black women are starting to celebrate each other a little bit more. Um, And so this is like a very exciting time. But historically, um, we've always kind of um, had this uh, stigma in our in our community where um, if you're succeeding somehow that's taking away from some a portion of success that I can have so um, uh, unfortunately it's not a, a lot of times that you see a lot of best, best practices being shared or um, you know people sharing about what they're doing to be successful and how they're making money um, different things like that unfortunately um, you know more of those conversations are about you know what's not right instead of what's right or, or how to correct issues. And I think that that stems from the fact that a lot of times our our parents, you know, we're getting our our financial lenses from them and they don't have a lot to pass down. So we're all just just kind of like aiming in the dark here. So um, I can say that I do appreciate that, um, you know, like now we're starting to celebrate each other more and starting to really um, put it, put ourselves in a position to, um, you know, want to grow. And and you're starting to see a lot more powerful black women, um, you know, sharing their successes. People like Sheena, you know, who I look up to, I love you girl. (laughs) Um, who are just like really standing up to empower women and 
that's one thing that I love so much in our company um, is that there is a platform for, uh, you know, a, a minority woman to be able to come in, learn financial concepts. It's not just a boys club, you know, learn financial concepts and then we can stand on our own two feet as well. So, um, you know, that's kind of my thought on 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 it right now. I don't know about you, Sheena, what your thoughts are, of, like yep. how historically the conversation has been. I mean, I think um, I think it's women in general, even with all kinds of races, money is a form of security mm -hmm. and and we're natural nurturers. And we just want to make sure that we have the the resources that we need to take care of the people that we love and care about. And when that that resource, we feel that we can't control it. Um, that's where a lot of the dissatisfaction, the anger, uh, the worry, um, the stress and the overall lack of, of keeping health up. That's where it all comes from is when we don't feel secure. And I, I was frustrated just uh, going down this path of go to school, uh, get a degree and get a job because all I felt like every step of the way, I was losing a little bit more control over money. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go, you go, most people are going to school because they're sold that if you get this degree, this piece of paper, you'll have security with a job and money. But then when they go get this degree, all they have is job insecurity and a bunch of debt. Mm -hmm. And then you go get a job and you get this job and you go look at your, your first pay stub and you notice that someone had dipped their hands in there before you had a chance to touch it. <laughs> and, uh, that's called the government and they take these things out called taxes. And then I go to, down to HR and I say, excuse me, um, who said you could do that? And then I realized that I've been trained my whole entire life to give up control over money. Mm -hmm. And here I am, the utmost control over my income is ordinary income, which is found through a job. If you pay the most in taxes. And I say, well, teach me how to have more control over money. Teach me portfolio income. Teach me passive income. Teach me how to control anybody touching my money except for me first. Mm -hmm. And then that, that avenue that I started to go down um, through this platform and, and any platform someone decides is to have more control over accessing money, making money, and what you do with the money. And that right there will solve a lot of the stress and anxiety, especially for women, especially for women. Yeah, so since we're both in the insurance industry, and obviously we're, we're um, uh, uh, building PHP agency uh, to be the next billion dollar company, uh, yeah. let's talk about insurance real quick, because I remember a video by Dr. Umar Johnson Mm -hmm. saying the reason why black families, Asian yep. families, and Latino families are so far behind is because white families believe in life insurance. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. right, well, which is a very profound statement. And, of course, he's not in the insurance industry, and I'm saying that because we're kind of biased because we are, but but it's a, re it's a reality. I mean, Spring, you have got a great video, a testimonial uh, from PHP Agency, how life insurance impacted your life and, and your daughter in, in a very profound way. What is life insurance stand in the conversation you have with people in the black community, with people in the Asian community, with people in the Latino community about their understanding about life insurance, not GoFundMe. Mm. Listen, it's, it's <laughs> <rough. Girl>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times. I mean, like in the Latino community, we're up against Sancho, you know, in the, black community, you know, in the black community, you know, they think they can't afford it. Um, you know, in, in sometimes in the Asian community as well. And, and I think that there's such a misconception because a lot of times people think, um, oh, I don't need that because I have something on my job, yep. you know, and I feel like that is like one of like, it's, it's great to have something, but at the end of the day, if you ever leave your job, you are immediately uncovered. Or let's say that you're like superstar employee, you stay there your whole life and the day you retire, you're immediately uncovered. And um, it's something that that um, I think we don't talk about enough um, in our communities. And I find that when we sit down with families um, in minority communities, yeah. um, you know, it's it's like a brand new conversation. It really is. Like a brand new conversation where they have right. no so insurance is a brand new conversation. Yes. yes. Wow. Yeah, it's a brand new conversation because it's it's just not something that a lot of people talk about, a lot of families even entertain. 
Um, and so, you know, thinking about, and, and especially like if we're not talking to the person who has children, like if we're talking to somebody that's young, somebody that's um, maybe older and their kids are out of the house, um, it's important for everybody to understand just how important it is because as soon as like, like something might happen to you, somebody's going to be here left behind. And, you know, that person, they're going to, you know, incur a huge amount of debt in, in a matter of seconds. Yeah. And it's important to make sure that your your family's protected. And then also just educating people on the fact that it's not only because I think um, in like especially Hispanic and black communities, you know, having life insurance is kind of like a stigma because it's like, oh, well, I'm wishing bad things on me and my family. If I'm if I'm expecting for that, if I'm planning for death, I'm not going to plan for death. So but the thing is, is helping educate people that, you know, there it's not only a vehicle for death, but there's also it's also a vehicle for your life, for your finances and different things like that. A, a great vehicle to um, to, you know, learn how to get yourself out of taxes, things like that. So um, to me, I think that that it's a it's a brand new conversation and and. Yeah. I don't know what your experience been. Oh uh, man, it's it's crazy because I, I think the distribution of life insurance has been stopped. Mm -hmm. Right. So you start talking about the majority is eventually going to be, you know, which is the minority currently is going to be eventually the majority. Yep. And I think that, you know, in insurance right now, you start talking about the representation of insurance is usually a 59 year old Caucasian white male currently right now. And there's nothing wrong with being that. But the issue is, is that they're not literally welcome in a black community or Asian community. Middle Eastern community, Hispanic community, where they are willing to, where we're going to listen to them because of trust. There's been a trust issue. There's been a blockage if we're being transparent here today. So because of that, we don't listen when people are talking about life insurance and things like that. So we have a stigma because that distribution from the companies with these Fortune 500 firms, such as a Fidelity, AIG, John Hancock, and all these different firms that have the, I would say, the solution to our problem, by the way. The solution yep. that literally we're creating a generational curses each and every day because of financial strategies that we're indirectly, you know, pursuing each and every day. They have the solution and can literally teach us how to get out of that. But the person that's supposed to distribute that information, unfortunately, we don't trust them. So we block it. So we're like, we don't even want to hear it. And so now because of that, we have this big misconception on how real life insurance really works and things along those lines. And not really understanding that it is actually our savior to the situations that we're trying to solve in the first place. It really actually is going to create that wealth strategy that we're all looking for. And that goes because the average agent today, the average life insurance agent today in the industry is a 60 year old Caucasian male. Mm -hmm. right? And they may or may not be going into the black communities. They may or may not be going to Latino and Asian communities. Yeah. And so and that might be a stigma. That might be a stigma to it. So, hey, guys, if you're tuning in right now, you're tuning into the Money Smart Guy Facebook live channel on the podcast called The Movement. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel make sure to, to access more of these conversations. If you share this, we're going to look through all the shares of all the comments that go through. If you share this video to the most friends, uh, you share it on their timeline, you share it in groups. I want to give you, sweetie, can you hand me that book? Uh, I, want to, I want to send you from my office to your home or your office. I want to send you this book called Principles written by Ray Dalio. Right. This is a book that you need to if you want to build wealth, it's got to be built based on principles. And we want to send this to you as our gift, as uh, this is what we're reading as far as the Entrepreneur Book Club. So, uh, well, let's get back to the conversation. Uh, sweetheart, you're, you're dealing with insurance. You bring up insurance, black community, black neighborhoods, black kitchen table, Asian kitchen table, Latino kitchen table. What's going on? I, I just think it goes back to like what we're taught to value. I mean, it's 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 a misperception to think that uh, people don't or cannot afford this thing called life insurance. I think if you ask everybody in a room and I always do this little exercise, I'm, I'm telling my tricks. Um, but I said, if insurance was free, how much would you want? And everyone says, I want the most that I can possibly get. And then I say, OK, great. It tells me what that you understand the value of it, um, but you don't value it because the minute I say, how much would you pay for it? It's the, the least amount that I possibly can pay for it. And then I go back and say, when, when along the line of growing up, do we learn that, you know, paying for, you know, a pair of shoes or uh, a concert or who knows what is more valuable than securing the most precious thing to you, which is your life. And I think that's where it goes back to that this, what they were mentioning where this conversation is so new because this conversation has been lost in translation for so many decades. But if we don't change this conversation back to where it should be, then we're, then we're going to keep seeing this, this gap 
continue to, to go wider and wider and wider. And I remember, I remember this talking to um, a nurse that, that typically goes out to families and she does what they call paramed, which is taking blood and urine samples to get people approved. And the profound question that was asked to her, she said, we asked her, she said, listen, when you go to minority households, tell me the average death benefit that you've noticed. Oh, and so, so she's the nurse that goes to the different homes to draw blood. Right. And, and, and urine to qualify applicants for a life insurance policy. Correct. And okay. so she has visibility on knowing what kind of uh, death benefit amounts um, that are taken. And she says minority household on average, she noticed about 200,000. And I said, I'm just curious. I'm just curious. When you go to Caucasian households, what's their average death benefit? And she says, it's not 200,000. It's not 500,000. It's not even a million. Average death benefit is $2 million. Ooh, wow. Wow. So it tells me the, the value system of different cultures, but we, we can't pretend like we don't see that there's a direct correlation with valuing what's really valuable to one demographic is not valuable to another demographic. Mm -hmm. And then we see this wealth gap continue to go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But because we're taught not to ask these questions about, hey, there's something that I'm doing that's a mistake. You know, we're not taught to do that because we have too much pride and ego. And if we were to do that, we would see a pattern, an obvious pattern that we need to address. So let's talk solutions, right? So there's obviously a big nugget and you guys are dropping a huge amount of comments. Uh, I want to I want to bring up Alvaro's comment here. So, Matt, I believe that the Hispanic community lacks a lot of information for the fact that we're not brought up with this knowledge. We are brought up believing that when a family member passes away, it is the family members to come together and fork out the money to help or go out and go do a GoFundMe. They also believe that the only way to have a good retirement is by working three jobs. Unreal. Because they have no understanding about the power of an annuity or an IOL or you know, financial instruments for that matter. So, so, so let's talk solutions. GoFundMe, that's a reactive solution. That's defense. But according to this report, let me reference this report again. Uh, there's three bullet points here. Number one is change the nation's tax code to chop up the wealth created by the wealthy, tax the rich, and break up money. Increase the federal estate tax and create a net worth tax on multi-million dollar fortunes. Now, we have an issue with that because you guys are making six figures on the way to seven figures. We, we're making seven figures <laughs> and we've busted our tails. Now we got here. Now they want to bust up our wealth. So, so I have a problem with that. Number two, their, their, their suggestion is to protect low, low income families from wealth stripping practices by strengthening the Consumer Protection Financial Protection Bureau and closing offshore accounts. I'm, I'm not sure the last time somebody's offshore account ever affected my life. <laughs> you know, um, and invest in new programs like children's savings accounts, automatic enrollment retirement accounts. Federal jobs guarantees in a racial wealth divide audit of government policies. So th these are three bullet points from this from this huge report. But never did they say increase financial education. Never did they say talk about money at the grade school level with our children. Never did they say introduce entrepreneurship, free enterprise, capitalism. How, how has this conversation affected your lives? I mean, Curtis, you're a professional basketball player, spring, a model, right? How does capitalism, free enterprise change your life? I'm the backup dancer. Back, you're back. <laughs> right? And you, you, guys are, you, guys are, you guys are right now and arguably in the, the last 90 days, the fastest growing agency with inside PHP in the marketplace today. Uh, coming from December, January, February, now going into March. I mean, what's going on in your office over there? What type of solutions are you guys talking about? One second. Go ahead, for me. Um, so for us, we are just very, very, very big on, you know, helping our community understand the crusade of what we do, understanding how important it is to go out there and, and educate 
like we lead with financial education and that's that's huge huge for us you know um helping people to understand their options um because like you said you know we make seven to ten decisions about money every single day yet unfortunately in in every level of education you know there's that there's a huge lack you know no one really learns about their finances and how to make it work for them you know at the school level so we are equipping our, our um, agents to really fall in love with the educational part of what we do here and uh, really go out there and, and be passionate about helping families. Um, you know, mine is one that that definitely benefited on both ends of, you know, having life insurance. I, you know, my first husband actually ended up passing away at 27 years old. I was pregnant at the time, had a three year old daughter. And, you know, that life insurance policy um, that I didn't even know we had that he only got three months before he passed away. Mm. It afforded me to have an opportunity to pick up the pieces and, you know, have a leg to stand on. And really, like, gave me the luxury to really grieve for him um, in that period of time. And then on the other end, you know, now being more educated about how to use these different vehicles. Um, you know, my husband and I, we put ourselves in a position where, you know, our our kids, their college is pretty much set for now based if on if they want to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they want to do, you know, by the time they, they get of age, they're they're going to have you know, wealth already accumulated for themselves. And so um, for us, it's just really like understanding how to how to educate our our community and Brilliant. becoming more passionate about that. The segue to education. It's because yeah. what she's saying is, is it edu I, you're, the solution to what we're saying right now? It's either educated or being entertained. And we we're having that conversation cool. yesterday, you know, on the Dream Team call with Patrick Bedeva, which we call Big Coach, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, literally, you know, he brought up, you know, if we could look at the top thousand right now views on YouTube, it's probably going to be mostly entertaining videos, mm -hmm. but it's not going to talk about how to, you know, understand financial services or how to, you know, create wealth or how to do these different aspects that are solutions to our problems that we complain about each and every day to everyone. Yep. But we're not really searching for how to get out of those situations. Because today our society is in a focus of, I just want to be entertained. I just want to be entertained. I don't even have the money to be entertained, but I'm willing to spend the last bit of my money to yeah. go get entertained. You know, <laughs> instead of positioning myself and investing in myself and educating myself effectively so that I don't ever have to be in a situation where I have to complain and, with my wife about why we can't do these different things for me and our kids and all these different aspects that are, are allowing measures to, today to divorce and many other aspects. So I think a solution more than anything is to change the mindset of how we think to saying, do we really want to be educated and do we really want to solve our problems or do we just want to be entertained and continue to complain about our issues? Mm -hmm. okay. I had a question for you. I'm just curious. Had it not been for that life insurance policy, being a mother of a three-year-old pregnant with your baby, where, where would you have gotten the financial resources to move on with life even though the bills have no – I mean, that, 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 that struggle – the death of your first husband, did ever your bills call you and say, you know what? I know you're going through a bad time right now. <laughs> We're going to give you a pass on your cell phone bill. We're going to give you a pass on your rent. We're going to give you a pass on your car note. We're going to give you a pass on daycare. Did they ever do that to you? Absolutely not. So where, where would you keep the money had you not had the life insurance policy? Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, I didn't know that I had it. I only had three thousand dollars in my bank at the time, which was is pretty typical for young families, um, you know, to not have a lot of money saved. Yeah. And um, so I was, you know, typical young married couple, and I only had three thousand dollars, which was not even enough for his casket. Um, I had to move out of my house. I had to put everything in storage. I had to move in with my mom. I was on an air mattress. Um, so that was the first way of, of finding money was to get rid of everything and, and you know, kind of sell my house and, and try to figure out what I could do there. Um, and then outside of that, you know, my uncle's a pastor, so I was grateful for him. He was able to negotiate some deals on the funeral for me, um, which was really interesting. And then um, GoFundMe wasn't even around at the time, so I had to turn to PayPal and post pictures, um, you know, on the Internet, on Facebook. And, you know, I'm getting emotional about that because that was really hard for me as a person to have to um, go to my community and ask them to help me. And um, unfortunately, you know, the, I mean, during that time, it wasn't something that was, you know, a lot of people did. So, you know, we did have a response and people were, you know, willing to help me. Um, but even then, I, it still wasn't enough. 
you know, it still wasn't enough. I was, you know, even, even his bills were still coming in. So it wasn't just mine. His bills were still coming in and, and it was, it was really hard. Um, I honestly don't know what, what I would have done if that call never came in because I was drowning. Um, I probably would have been one of those people who would have had to get two and three jobs and, you know, never see my kids and work, you know, till my bone, like, you know, to my bones to try to get myself just back out of that debt. Not even, not even to, to advance, but just to get myself afloat back to where I was before he, um, you know, he passed away. And so, you know, when that call came, I was so grateful. Um, and, and it's really interesting because even today, you know, with the GoFundMe's and stuff, it's so like when I had PayPal, no one was really doing that. But with GoFundMe, I mean, every other post, someone has passed away. So people are desensitized. So today people don't even have the same options that I had to reach out to the community because unfortunately, you know, it's like, oh, another sad story. But if I help every sad story, then I need help, yeah. you know? So um, like, you know, in my situation, I, I don't know the answers. I don't know what I would have done because there's, there's no quick wow. answer to that. I, to this day would have been still probably trying to get myself out of that debt. Wow. And that was five years ago. So, oh. um, you know, I, and, and today for people who are, are, you know, in the GoFundMe era, I, I honestly don't even know, you know, what that answer would be. So that's why it's so important to pre-plan and yep. think ahead. And, and GoFundMe takes 15% of whatever you collect as their fee. Yeah. Wow. And not even talk about what Visa, MasterCard takes in a or credit card charge. So, babe, I mean, you, you've got a finance degree, University of Pittsburgh, uh, minor in marketing. Was this conversation about wealth building ever something you talked about in college, with the, even with the finance degree? No, I, I mean, and that goes to show why it's such a problem. Like we are literally taught to depend on anybody but ourselves for everything. We, we got to depend on a job to determine our wealth. We have to depend on the government to know when to tax us. We have to depend on the government for Social Security for retirement. We have to depend on um, a person who manages a 401k that we're never going to see our entire life. But yet we'll give him money for 20, 30 years and we have to depend on him to make sure we're taken care of. And I sit there and say, even these these options they give, everything is about dependency on the government on every. Yeah. On, on these entities that obviously don't do a good job of managing money, just my opinion. And I wish <laughs> they would, I feel like they're so afraid to teach people independence. Like, I think they're deathly afraid of it oh, because you know what? When controlled people have knowledge to know what to do for themselves it gives the people that have been controlling them a run for their money Yeah, because those people are sitting back, obviously collecting on the fact that we are left in ignorance because they won't provide this information that we, we really do want. We feel it in our gut, especially the millennial generation. Like I've never seen a generation now more than ever that is questioning going to school and going to college and having a job. And guess what? For millennials, go on that right path because I think we're in the information age. And when you're in the information age, people can't hide this information anymore. So we're, right. we're becoming more knowledgeable and platforms like PHP and entrepreneurs and people that want to challenge the traditional norm are getting people to think independently. And that's what we need for America right now. Independent thinkers, not dependent thinkers. True. Awesome. So if you guys are watching this show, you're watching the Money Smart Guy on Facebook Live call, podcast called The Movement. If you watch this on YouTube, thank you for your comments and what your thoughts are in the comments below. So as we wrap stuff up, guys, uh, you know, if they want to reach out and say, you know what, Curtis, spring, this stuff makes sense. I don't want to be in a racial wealth divide. I don't want to be stuck in the problem. Uh, I know silently what happens is people watch the cat videos and, uh, and you know, and they drop their comments and share it. But silently they watch our videos yeah. In private messages. I know that happens all the time. <laughs> I'm coming out because everything's going good. I can't comment on your video because, and by the way, for those of you that have been commenting, those of you as part of the PHP family or, or the wealth building and entrepreneurial community together, thank you so much yeah. for your comments and, and sharing this video because we're going to pick the person that shares this video the most in the multiple timelines and multiple groups. We'll be able to see that. We want to give you this book, Principles by Ray Dyer, as a gift from us by joining this conversation and sharing this because. Sharing is caring, but uh, um, what, what, what can people do? What would, what would you say, Curtis Spring? What are the next steps for them? They're watching this video right now. What would you encourage them to do 
to say, you know what? I want a solution. I want to fix my life. My shit's broken. Help me fix it. Yeah, the yeah, biggest the thing, thing is taking action. action. You know, you know we always say, speaking, speak, we can we have faith all day, but you don't think no action is going to happen for you, bro. And it's pretty interesting you're saying that because um, it's, I had a person reach out to me and I was talking about the PHB agency with them about two years ago. And I sent them a message and I said, hey, um, I, I don't care if you do it or not. I just want to make sure you have the education so you can make informed decisions about your life so that you won't be in a position knowing that you were the Ronald Wayne. Right? <laughs> All right. And if you don't know who Ronald Wayne is, it was the individual that sold his shares of Apple. Right. Um, before they went public. And now those shares would have been worth, worth over $7 billion. Um, but he sold it for like 2,300 bucks or something like that. Something low, right? And, uh, $100, bro. 800 bucks, <laughs> man. Yeah, it's really terrible. And, and, and literally, he calls me yesterday and he says, you know what? Um, I'm ready. You know, I'm ready for this information. For the last two years, I haven't been doing what I needed to do. I wish I would have listened, but now I'm glad that I'm, I'm opening up doing it. And I thanked him. You know why I thank him? Because so many people, have so much pride and ego today, even though they know they should reach out and direct message you, they won't because they allow their pride and ego to stop them from the opportunity that can literally help their lives. So if you're on this call and you're like, wow, I do believe in the value that we're speaking about here today. And, you know, I would like to reach out and have a conversation. You want to read for us. We're in the Ranch Kukumanga area and uh, you can reach out to us through Facebook. You know, my name is Curtis Eatman um, and it's literally type in and you'll see our face spring Eatman. Uh, we're on Snapchat as well. Uh, we're pretty easy to find. Um, on Instagram as well. Those are the pretty easiest ways to find us. You're more than welcome even to direct contact us. We even send our number out. We're pretty open. Um, we're pretty easy to find. So yeah, if you're if you're open to reaching out to us, more than welcome to do that. I want to show this article that you just mentioned from. Uh, 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 I'll put the link on it because our, our yeah. computer here is fritzing out. But uh, I don't want to steal from your value. But uh, we'll, we'll put the link of who Ronald Wayne is. Because hey, I have say, a post. I'll send it to you right now. It's, uh, it's yeah. like, having a bad day. <laughs> having a bad day. Just understand you're not him. All right? <laughs> because, again, he would have been worth $70 billion. Now he's selling coins in his garage because of his pride and ego and not having vision. Yeah. So hopefully that uh, is not you on this call. <laughs> so what would you say your solutions? There's, there's a woman out there, black woman out there, uh, Latina that's out there, Asian. Um, by the way, this is not a, a racial thing. Listen, you're out there, you're living paycheck to paycheck, right? Sweetheart, what, what would be your solution? To what would you what would you say? I, I just want people to to embrace the the feeling they have inside and find the platform that will teach them independence and just stay away from a platform that just teach teaches them to depend on people. And I think if if they find that avenue and they seek that out. That's what's going to save them. Don't look for somebody to save you. Don't look for somebody to give you a fish. Go ask that person to teach you how to fish. That's it. Well said. I agree. If you if you uh, join us right now, thank you guys for joining us right now. Thank you for watching the replay. And uh, my my suggestion to you guys: if you want to change your life, you got to surround yourself with a community of people that want to know more, do more, and be more. Yep. There's there's a lot of people out there that uh, would like what Curtis just mentioned. They'd rather be entertained, but they don't want to get educated. That's why I busted out this this slew of books of things that we've read dealing with finances. Okay, mm -hmm. right? Instead of Netflixing and binge watching stuff, read <laughs> about money. So therefore, your family, your children, your next generation will be blessed. And if you become a blessing now. You'll be a big blessing later on down the road because what you're going to learn is just going to grow and compound. And if you're looking for that community, watching this right now, you're looking for the community to connect with, reach out to us, Curtis and Spring Even in Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, my, my wife, Shane, and I, we're here in Oak Brook, Illinois. And by the way, we have 42 other offices across the country. If you're watching this and you're in California, Northern California, uh, East Coast, Florida, <laughs> Texas, Tennessee, Arizona, you name it. The only state that we're not in is Montana. We just can't find somebody to move out there to service the six people that live out in Montana. But uh, about a month ago, we also expanded in Puerto Rico. But PHB agency right now, we're proud to say, is a big solution to this problem because you're talking to you're talking right now. You're watching this live stream video with a bunch of multicultural middle class kids from average and ordinary neighborhoods, yeah. but we're in six figure income, right? Uh, my wife and I are in seven-figure income, 
and we're just not the only ones in our, in our company, right? And uh, we want to connect with you with you because if you want to make six figures, if you want to make seven figures, uh, and about the curse and spring, you got some crazy cars. But what's some of the cars you guys drive? I, I mean, spring, you got the Porsche, right? The Porsche Cayman. Oh yeah. The, the Cayenne, baby. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cayenne. Cayman. Cayman, right? Curtis, what you, what you, what's your, what, what you driving these days, brother? I have an M4, a BMW, yeah. Get with me. <laughs> Get with me. So, listen, you can, you can help people yeah. get a solution to the problem, have fun, and make a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. So, that being said, guys, thanks for joining this live stream. I don't think it will be the last. Um, we're we're going to be uh, we're going to be celebrating. Hey, listen, guys, are we are we going to Cuba or what? Woo! Uh, we're going to Cuba or what? Right? <laughs> uh, PHP agency, we, we've got we've got a, we've got a, um, we've got a, a motivation for our top guys. I think I've got top forty or top fifty guys. We're taking them to a trip to Cuba. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Alvaro wants to know what what do you drive? Well, I drive a uh, Mercedes Benz Mille Miglia. There's only there's only, uh, only five hundred of them. 500 of them in the world. Uh, what else we drive? We drive a Cadillac Escalade um, Platinum, which is the most expensive domestic SUV in the marketplace today. And and uh, the, the cool part is how you buy them. I mean, <laughs> right? like, like you buy cars, you don't even go to the dealership anymore. Right? Babe, babe how did you buy a car? I just walked in and said, give me everything. Right? What's the most expensive car in this lot? But the, 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 how they look at you because you are a multicultural. Like, wait, what are you, what are you doing here? You they gave me that look. I, I yeah, love. That I, look. I absolutely love that look. Okay. That's <laughs> it. No, we're not here to test drive, baby. I <laughs> <laughs> just want it. Let's go. I love it. Here's my address. You can you can send it to me here. Yeah. <laughs> Ship it here. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, cool guys. With that being said, well, thank you guys. Thank you for being so generous with your time. For thank everybody that's watching this. You got it. And for everybody that's out there watching this, thank you for joining us on this every Wednesday, guys. Every Wednesday, 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, the Movement Podcast, the Movement Facebook Live video is going out because we wanted to help transform the way you think, feel, and manage uh, your way towards financial independence. With that being said, on behalf of my wife, Sheena, and on behalf of our good friends, Curtis and Spring Eman out there in Rancho Cucucucucucuamonga, California, <laughs> until we meet again. Continue to live smart. Continue to love smart. And be money smart today. All right, guys. <laughs> Take you guys later. Bye. Right. Love you guys. Bye-bye.